Three people have been shot and injured in the Shankill Road area of Belfast. It happened as thousands of loyalists, some of them wearing masks and paramilitary uniforms, marched through the area for what was described as a festival of Protestant culture. Yvette Shapiro reports. Today was billed as a community festival on the Shankill, but it's ended in violence. The latest chapter in what's becoming an increasingly bloody loyalist feud. Eyewitnesses say there was a confrontation between LVF and UVF supporters outside the Rex bar. Minutes later, they say, hundreds of men from the UDA parade ran to the bar and surrounded it. Then shots rang out, hitting at least two men in the crowd. One man was shot in the face and is undergoing surgery. The condition of a second man is not yet known. A woman's been treated for minor injuries. As police combed the scene for forensic evidence, blame was already being laid. No, I'm in no doubt it was UFF supported by the LVF, no question of it. This was our prayer today and they decided that they were going to shoot loyalists. Uh, and I think that what they're saying is that no UF, UVF man or PUP supporter or anybody else is allowed to live in any loyalist area, they're going to drive them out. I would ask people to remain calm, but I would have to say I think that the UVF leadership at the end of their teller. I would also say that the grassroots in the UVF at the end of their teller, watching what's happening here. Just before the shooting, these masked men had led several thousand men and bands in a parade along the Shankill Road. Onlookers say it was the biggest show of strength by the UDA and UFF for many years. Yvette Shapiro, BBC News, on the Shankill Road. The outlawed loyalist group, the Ulster Freedom Fighters, had been holding a parade down the Shankill Road to celebrate new murals being unveiled in the area. According to an eyewitness, when the parade passed the Rex Bar, a known hangout for rival loyalist group, the Ulster Volunteer Force, an altercation took place. Shortly afterwards, three to four armed men removed the security grills from the bar's window before opening fire into the packed small bar room. Three people were taken to hospital. One man is undergoing surgery, although his injuries are not life-threatening. The Progressive Unionist Party, which represents the UVF, was quick to point the finger. I'm in no doubt that these were members of the Ulster Defence Association and the UFF. I'm in no doubt of that, uh, supported by members of the LVF. We are constantly told by Mr Adair and others that they're supporters of the peace process and they're not supporters of the LVF, but today proves to me that they are. Relations between the UVF and UFF have worsened in recent months, with the release in July of former UFF commander Johnny Adair only adding to the tension. It seems loyalists are increasingly turning on each other. Shankill Road area of Belfast last night. Six people were hurt when loyalist gunmen opened fire in two separate attacks. A loyalist pensioner inspects the damage after an attack by loyalists on his home. But this pensioner is Gusty Spence, perhaps the best known figure in the Ulster Volunteer Force. His house was targeted as part of the growing feud between the UVF and sections of the rival UDA, the Ulster Defence Association. I'm making an appeal to all the decent, honest, clean living, right thinking UDA men to isolate a pocket that is within them that's responsible for this type of thing. It was the parade on Saturday organised by the UDA which sparked the latest violence. Shots were fired at this pub on the Shankill Road. Seven people suffered bullet wounds in all. The UVF and UDA blame each other. I'm appealing to both sides to look at what's going on here, particularly the UVF. If the UVF look at, at, at the situation that arose yesterday, they must surely understand the consequences of what was, what was done because of the disruption to that parade. What we're effectively seeing, we're seeing a form of ethnic cleansing within the Protestant community in West Belfast, and that is of no benefit to the community or to anybody else. Tending to the injured, this the aftermath of a second gun attack on the Rex pub on the Shankill Road last night. And the violence didn't stop here. A house in Ambleside Street, its front peppered with automatic gunfire. Next door is the family home of the PUP's Billy Hutchinson. He believes both attacks are the work of the UFF and is concerned at the turn of events. Well, it's going to end in death. I don't think there's any question in it. Uh, these people last night attacked this home behind us. Uh, these are innocent people. They were out at their work, and if they hadn't have been at work at, uh, at one o'clock in the morning, uh, these people would have been shot dead. It went straight into their bedroom. The house was riddled with an AK-47, and the police are sitting 50 yards away and done nothing about it. The trouble evolved from what was billed as a community festival on the Shankill yesterday afternoon. The UDP claims the shootings were possibly prompted by an attack by UVF members on a bandsman. 
The government has asked for a full report from the RUC on last night's violence before deciding on what steps to take. Julian O'Neill, BBC News, Belfast. Fusion and panic on the Shankill Road last night. Around 10 o'clock, gunmen drove past the Rex Bar, opening fire indiscriminately, injuring three men. The PUP's Billy Hutchinson was among the crowd of people standing outside. Less than seven hours earlier, four people drinking inside the bar were hurt when it was sprayed with bullets, following a confrontation between rival UVF and LVF supporters, an attack which Billy Hutchinson also believes was the work of the UFF. Around one o'clock this morning, a gunman opened fire on the house next door to the assembly member in Ambleside Street off the Shankill. A couple and their two children were not at home at the time. That's without a doubt it was UFF. Uh, and I'd have to say to you that one of the gunmen who carried out the attack yesterday in the Rex Bar <coughs> drove past this house half an hour ago uh, and the police still haven't even arrested him and he's running about freely. What do you think? What are your fears for the future? Well, my fears are that there's going to be dead bodies in the street. Uh, there should, I suppose in many ways uh, we were very lucky that there was none last night. Earlier, a number of homes were ransacked and some set on fire in the lower Shankill area. Windows were smashed in this bungalow belonging to the former UVF leader, Gusty Spence. I'm appealing to people to use whatever persuasion they can to stop this nonsense, not only here but across the whole sector end of aid. Stop it now. Observers knew it wasn't a question of if but when the UVF would retaliate for the UFF's weekend of mayhem on the Shankill Road and when the revenge attack came today, it was swift, it was ruthless. But it also appears that one of the two men shot dead on the Crumlin Road was one of the UVF's own supporters. The main target for the gunmen was Jackie Coulter, who's aligned to the UDA. But Bobby Mahood, the other man shot alongside him in a Land Rover discovery, was, according to the Progressive Unionist Party, linked to the UVF. The two victims were shot by a lone gunman as they sat in the vehicle outside a bookmaker's shop on the Crumlin Road. Jackie Coulter was an associate of the convicted UFF leader Johnny Adair, who visited the scene of the shooting along with John White of the UDP. Within minutes, the UVF had the guns out again. They spread the offices of the UDP's prisoners' aid organisation on the Shankill Road with bullets. One man inside sustained a minor hand injury. Several bullet holes were visible in the plate glass window of the office. John White said he believed the UVF had been hoping he or Johnny Adair would have been in the offices, which they use as a base. The shooting sparked fury within the UDA and UFF. A 20-strong mob was seen running down the Shankill Road to the offices of the Progressive Unionist Party. The men who weren't masked attacked the building with hammers and other weapons, trying to shatter the armour-plated windows. Eventually, they set fire to the building. There were also reports that shots had been fired at it. PUP leaders who'd been in the office a short time earlier had left the building before the attack. It's ten past two, and the sense of fear on the Shankill Road is almost palpable. The feud between the UVF and the UFF has now exploded into the worst violence seen here for many years. The question people here are asking now is what's going to happen next? A taxi office further down the Shankill Road was also smashed up. Shops and offices along the road closed down as workers fled, terrified that they would be caught up in the feud between the UVF and the UFF. In the Shankill estate, UDA men openly patrolled the area, deciding who could and couldn't go in. The RUC criticised for not doing enough to curb the weekend violence. Litter surged into the estate. Officers with their rifles drawn leapt from their vehicles, but they were quickly confronted by a gang of loyalists and they eventually withdrew. However, police later fired shots in the Malvern Street district, but there were no reports of any injuries. In another part of the estate, a mob set fire to a car. Two people were later arrested and weapons recovered at Brookmount Street off the Shankill Road. Tensions had been soaring in the area all weekend after the UFF shot seven people and wrecked UVF supporters' homes after claiming the UVF had attacked a UFF parade on Saturday. The PUP's Billy Hutchinson, who'd appealed for calm, didn't try to deflect responsibility for today's murders from the UVF. Will you condemn it? No, I won't condemn it. Uh, I think it's a tragedy. Uh, and uh, it should, as far as I'm concerned, we should never have got to this stage. But I'm saying the person responsible, everybody knows who he is, and they know the organisation that's responsible for bringing us this. But why won't you condemn it? Because condemnation doesn't get us anywhere. I think what we need to do is ensure that no more lives are lost. But unfortunately, we're in a situation where people are angry, frustrated, 
uh, and they can't see why people are trying to take them down this road and they've had the lash out. Unfortunately, the two men it's dead, can't be brought back uh, and I'm sure uh, that there'll be others before the night's out or before the week's out. But I just hope people come to their senses and stop it. The UDP's Joan White, who'd appealed earlier for mediation, admitted the Shankill was now running out of control. It is almost anarchy, isn't it? Well, oh, yeah, if you look here today, it would appear that would be the case, because you'd be up and running about shooting people, and uh, you know the, the people are shooting. You know, two people who are well known in this community for the community work to do to help prisoners. One, uh, a UDA welfare worker. Another one would have helped the UVF welfare side. It was absolutely ridiculous. The UFF have been obviously active too. The PUP officers have been wrecked and set on fire. Yes, well, the, the blame for the start of the, of, of the troubles is with the UVF. They shot a man dead, seriously injured another one, and then they shot through the offices of the uh, prisoner jail, which is aligned to the UDP. And now we have retaliation by, obviously, UFF supporters who have attacked the PUP officers. And that's a way it'll continue if people don't get a grip on the situation. That's why I'm appealing for both sides to draw back and to think of, of the disastrous consequences for the people of the Shankill Road. The RUC have responded to the chaos in the Shankill by requesting the deployment of soldiers back on the streets from tonight. The RUC say it's a short-term measure and an indication of their determination to pursue what they call the criminals preying on local communities. Ivan Little, UTV Live, Belfast. Well, with me now for his assessment of what's going on is our chief security correspondent, Brian Rowan. Brian, no love lost but in, in this loyalist feud, but how did this weekend violence and the latest murders, how has that wave of violence sparked off? Well, Kim McGuinness referred there to a simmering situation and things within loyalism haven't been good for months. But in terms of this latest violence, I understand uh, there was a meeting last Wednesday on the Shankill Road between senior UFF and senior UVF figures. It was about Saturday's march. I'm told that the UVF was given an assurance that there would be no display of LVF material during that march. We're then told that an LVF flag was produced at one stage, that there was a confrontation at the march. And then out of that, you had the two gun attacks outside uh, the Rex bar, then the attacks on the houses. And now today, the UVF response to what the, UV, sorry, to what the UFF did at the weekend. So I spoke to one loyalist source this morning. He said the situation was dire. Uh, people are saying it's now too late for mediation. One loyalist source said today all bets are off in terms of uh, mediation. And we have a bad situation becoming worse by the hour. We had the Secretary of State there saying, giving no definite word on whether the ceasefire has been broken or not. But people watching this programme will see armed gunmen shooting, in the, uh, shooting and carrying out murders, but also showing a display of strength on platforms on the Shankill Road. When is the ceasefire not broken and when is it broken at all? Well, it all goes back to what these people announced uh, during their ceasefires in uh, 1994. Loyalism said that there would be a cessation of operational hostilities, meaning no attacks on the Catholic, nationalist and Republican community. The government has never introduced any political sanction for internal loyalist or internal Republican uh, violence. So these groups have seen themselves get away with this in the past. Uh, they, they now believe that they'll get away with it again. There were warnings in the past that uh, prisoner releases were being kept under review, but nothing happened. And now all the prisoners are out. Yes, what about prisoner releases? There were calls there today from Andrew Mackay for Johnny Adair to be returned to prison. What's the likelihood of that happening? Well, it, it depends what the police tell the Secretary of State in this report that he's waiting for. Andrew Mackay does believe there is sufficient evidence to return Johnny Adair to jail. I spoke to one senior police officer today and he said that the, uh, the government had made a tragic error uh, of judgment in allowing these people out. Now, I referenced to some of the people who had been given uh, release under the, uh, the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. And there are police officers who uh, are bitterly angry that uh, having spent years uh, in investigation and putting some of these people uh, in jail, that those people are now out. And they see what's happening uh, as an inevitable consequence of some of those releases. And with the soldiers back on the streets again, clearly the security assessment is very bleak, is it not? Well, the situation is not good. Um, additional police officers from uh, uh, attached to mobile support units have been uh, uh, sent to the Shankill this afternoon. We know that the army is going to be back on the streets of uh, Belfast this evening. They're uh, members of the uh, 1st Battalion, the Royal Green Jackets. They're based at Palace Barracks in Hollywood. And already some of those soldiers have been moved to Girdwood Barracks in, uh, in North Belfast. And that patrolling is expected within hours. Brian, thank you very much indeed.
Progressive Unionist Party. When I noticed a car coming up the balcony, I got up out of bed. I proceeded towards 11 on Monday. Next thing, this car pulled up. The fella jumped out with a full combat song, combat jacket and ski mask. And he left a rifle and I ducked and they fired two shots through 11 round window. Close to the time of the Durvok shooting, the home of another PUP member was shot at in Port Ballantrae, just a few miles away. In this house in Causeway View, two men were present, as well as a woman and two young children aged seven and five. I knew myself, I, I was intended at target, or because I, I'd be a member of the PUP and this area, and I put them, that's why this attack took place. And who do you think would have been behind this attack? Well, it, there's been an ongoing campaign in the area between the, uh, PUP, UVF and the local UDA, and it has been ongoing over a year or more now, and I would say they were probably behind it. Stephen Hanna says these shooting incidents are clearly a manifestation of the Loyalist feud and he believes there could well be reprisals for these attacks. Meanwhile, a DUP alderman says it's time for all loyalists to pull back from the brink. Out there on the ground within the Protestant community, they would say, say to you very, very clearly uh, that they are doing the work of the Republican movement by some of their activities, and that's probably right. Uh, the other issue as well, people would say to you, you know, what the provost couldn't do in 30 years in driving Protestants out, they are now doing it. Meanwhile, police are also investigating another gun attack on a home in the Loyalist Lincoln Courts estate in Derry's Waterside. At least six bullets struck this house. Again, it's a property owned by a member of the PUP. The house was also attacked last June. There was also an attack in Coal Rain. A car belonging to a senior PUP member in the town was vandalised in the town's Ballysally estate. Mark McFadden for UTV Live. A stroll in the Shankill sunshine this afternoon for convicted UFF commander Johnny Adair, but his bulletproof vest reflected the darker mood on the road. And only yards away, housing executive workers, guarded by the RUC, were helping families to flee from the feuding factions. Those people waited and wondered who would be the next victim of the bitter bloodletting between the UVF and the UFF. Security was significantly tighter in the Shankill today than over the previous 48 hours. Troops were back on the streets for the first time since September 1998, stopping traffic and questioning motorists. The feud, which yesterday claimed the lives of two loyalists on the Crumlin Road, was top of the agenda this morning for a two-hour meeting between the Secretary of State Peter Mandelson and the RUC Deputy Chief Constable Colin Cramphorn and the Army's GOC Sir Hugh Pike. There was no comment after the meeting, but it's believed that in the background there are attempts to get the two rival groupings to talk up a truce. On the Shankle this afternoon, Ulster Unionist Councillor Jim Rogers had a chance meeting with Johnny Adair. We were having a general walk and chat just round the area and he happened to arrive on the scene and I explained to him my concerns, my worries and I appealed to him to do all that he possibly could to see this come to an end and I've done exactly the same thing with John White of the Ulster Democratic Party. I mean this is not in anyone's interest. The only people who are benefiting from this are the enemies of Northern Ireland and that's IRA Sinn Féin. They're laughing up their sleeve at seeing Protestant attack a Protestant. What was the response from Johnny Adair? Well, he listened to us and hopefully he will take on board exactly how we think. A number of mediators have offered their services to the UVF and the UFF, but the Reverend Roy McGee, who helped broker the Loyalist ceasefire, said he didn't believe the paramilitaries were ready to talk yet. The Loyalist paramilitaries are still saying that this is not the right time to move into mediation. Uh, they have their own construction. I understand their thinking on that. But I believe that any time is the right time to move into a situation where you're trying to stop uh, violence of any description. The leader of the UDP, Gary McMichael, called for a halt to the shooting, saying the feud was tearing loyalism apart. But his party chairman, John White, said he believed retaliation for yesterday's UVF killings was inevitable. Any talk of mediation now, you know, is, is looked upon with, with scorn. And in, in actual fact, my role has almost become redundant. But I'll continue to try and convince people 
to open up some form of dialogue. But sooner or later, they will talk. But I feel, however, you know, that will not come about until we're walking behind more coffins. I think that's a real tragedy for, for the Loyalist people. The feud between Loyalist factions, which has spilled over into violence in the past four days, has called into question the aspects of the Good Friday Agreement concerning the release of terrorist prisoners on licence. The agreement's foundations lay in the Tory, Brooke and Mayhew administrations, and those who began that process say what's happened now with prisoner releases and no decommissioning is at odds with the spirit. We were told at the time, if you remember, that these releases would take place alongside the decommissioning of weapons, and that was so that the paramilitary organisations on both sides of this divide could indicate their commitment to the peace process and to a complete ceasefire. That didn't happen. We've now seen over the weekend killings which on any view uh, cannot indicate that the ceasefire is complete and we now believe that the government should take clear action to indicate that it is going to respond firmly to this situation by first of all returning uh, Johnny Adair and Michael Stone to prison but secondly by specifying under the Act the UVF and the UFF which would mean that if any prisoner is involved with those organisations then their licence would be revoked. Opponents of the Good Friday Agreement concur that the government is responsible for the current conditions and is now turning a blind eye to anything which may shake the fragile peace. If you create that sort of an atmosphere, uh, it is not surprising that uh, paramilitaries, um, that violence will escalate. Um, and I think that the government has failed in its responsibilities and is continuing to fail. So what do you see as the solution? What should they be doing? Well, I think one of the things they've got to consider um, is um, bringing prisoners back in again. If prisoners benefited, not because of their own virtues, but because they were members of an organisation, then government has got to really put down an ultimatum that if there's further violence, um, then the prisoners have got to be brought in. I think uh, government's got to bear responsibility. Um, I think, as Michael Gove put it, if you're bitten by a mad dog, then you've got to blame, at least in part, the person who let it off the leash in the first place. Sinn Féin says loyalism needs loyalism, to sort its house out. That, uh, you know, the leaderships of uh, both the, uh, the UDA and the UVF have to assert themselves. They're both on record. Their formal position is that they support the Good Friday Agreement. If that's the case, then they have to exercise some control uh, as leaderships and get back on the Good Friday Agreement agenda. Susan Miller, UTV Live, Belfast. One of the Shankill's most respected community workers, Baroness May Blood, says the atmosphere is more terrifying than at the time of the fish shop bombing. And she fears that neither side in the bloody feud is ready for mediation yet. Letitia Fitzpatrick reports. The atmosphere on the Shankill Road is tense despite a visible army presence. This early years project, built with millions from Europe and helping 600 families, was set up with the help of May Blood, now a baroness in the House of Lords and a respected community worker. She fears the loyalist infighting is not yet over. The last few days has been horrendous, particularly yesterday. Yesterday was like something from a scene from an old movie. And the fear on this road yesterday, you could have actually reached out and touched it. People were just running, getting off the street, and going into their homes and closing doors. I never thought I would see the Shankle back. In fact, I felt more fear on the Shankle yesterday than I did when the Shankle bomb went off. And that's saying something. How do you think this feud can be resolved? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different opinions. People are talking about mediation. People are talking about putting prisoners back into jail. I don't think we're at the stage. I've spoke to a number of people, and nobody has come up with any kind of a conclusion of how it can be resolved. I think these people have got to resolve it among themselves. What are they fighting about? And I think it's a, it's a disgrace for them to include ordinary people in it, to terrorise their own community. Is it a turf war and has it been heightened by the release of prisoners, the early release? It's a turf war, yes. There can be no other reason for it. Uh, these, these organisations were established to defend the Protestant people. We now find the Protestants are fighting Protestants, so it has to be about territory and power. Putting prisoners back in, or the release of prisoners, let me say that we've had many prisoners return to the community here and who have come back and made a positive, a positive contribution to the community. Whether lifting those, whether lifting certain prisoners would be the answer, I don't know. I just would fear that if it's a knee-jerk reaction, we could create martyrs here, and that would be the last thing we would want here. We do want anybody lifted unjustly. Other, if the secretary state has evidence, that's a different case. Do you think both sides are ready yet for mediation? No, I think there's too much bitterness. 
While many people in the Shankill are relieved that the army have arrived, they dread the repercussions of yesterday's murders. Letitia Fitzpatrick, UTV Live, Belfast. The police have revealed that five firearms were seized when two people were arrested at Brookmount Street off the Shankill Road during yesterday's disturbances. The men remain in custody. Three people are also being questioned after a security operation in South Belfast. A firearm and ammunition were recovered in the Lisburn Road area of the city. I'm joined now in the studio by the Ulster Unionist Councillor for the Shankill area, Chris Majimsey. Chris Majimsey, what difference did the soldiers on the Shankill make last night? Well, I think the soldiers made a significant difference. The first thing they did was they sealed off key areas, uh, which made it less uh, easy for uh, people to move from one area to the other. And uh, that has relieved also the, the police to put up more vehicle checkpoints. So uh, it's not unusual for me to be driving, maybe be stopped four times in a three, four minute drive. And that seems to have helped to stop the tit for tat attacks which obviously then brings us, we've had almost 24 hours where there's been no incidents and uh, I think we needed a breathing space. But is it a long-term solution? Well, that's not a long-term solution because a long-term solution is, is, is uh, peace and reconciliation and no soldiers on the streets and the police back to normal policing. But, I mean, it's the necessary short-term solution at the moment. What we need to do now is to see uh, a, a bit of breathing space no more violence and then the paramilitary groups to get to get talking and try and get mediation started. Yes, but can they talk? Will they talk to each other? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I simply don't know that. I'm not the person to ask. I mean, clearly that, that is what needs to happen. Uh, our community, people forget, I mean, we make up about 18% of West Belfast and we have withstood everything that's been thrown at us over 30 years and now the community is destroying itself, it's pulling itself apart and I mean this is a, a, a mania that has got to be stopped. Now the paramilitary groups will need to come together and try and work out how this can be stopped. The only other alternative is to just keep counting body bags. Is there a, is an alternative to, to re-arrest some of the prisoners who have been let out on licence? Um, no, I don't think so. Not just simply uh, in the terms which you put. I think my blood's right. I mean, as, as I understand the, the release on licence, uh, what happens is that pe uh, people are released on licence as long as they eschew violence and don't get involved in further violence. Now, presumably, if the police have evidence, the police then will recommend to the Secretary of State that certain licences be revoked. That's a policing matter, and that's something that the Secretary of State and, and, and the RUC Chief Constable will, will decide upon. But to, to suddenly jump in and start lifting prisoners, uh, or ex-prisoners, I think it would be a mistake. I think it would exacerbate the situation, and I don't think it would be particularly helpful. Do you think it's over? I would hope it's over. I'm not sure. Certainly every hour that there's another incident. I mean, peace bills are by hour. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, predict that it is now over. I think, there's a pos there's a, I think there's a window of opportunity here now that it can be ended. If it's not taken, then I think there's a possibility that violence might recommence after the funerals. On stage in October 1995, the political representatives of loyalism. This was one year after the ceasefire. There was a combined Loyalist military command, and the PUP and the UDP had given Loyalism a political voice. There was no sign of division back then. Three Loyalist paramilitary organisations made up the combined Loyalist military command. The UDA, which also uses the name the UFF, they're the same organisation. The other groups were the UVF and the Red Hand Commando. The political representatives of the UDA can be found in the Ulster Democratic Party and the Progressive Unionist Party is aligned to the UVF and the Red Hand Commando. Later another paramilitary group would emerge, the LVF, which grew out of a split in the UVF. I will not become part of a process that's designed to ease our people into a United Ireland and to destroy all semblance of our Britishness. The roots of the feuding within loyalism can be traced back to this man. Billy Wright once held a senior position in the UVF, but it was he who in 1996 formed the Breakaway LVF, a faction which emerged in Mid-Ulster. Although Billy Wright had been very strongly pro the ceasefire, he actually became anti the ceasefire, he, he rejected the ceasefire, and uh, it seems there was an element down there who said about trying to undermine the ceasefire of, of, the, the, the ceasefire of loyalists. A row between the UFF and the UVF over what should happen to Wright led to the crumbling of the combined Loyalist Military Command in October 1997. There was a number of reasons why it crumbled, but I think it, uh, one of the reasons was that uh, you know the UFF in the Lower Shankill uh, and the people that represented them pu were pushing very hard at UVF. They actually deal with Billy Wright, and the UVF told them that that was an internal problem. 
Yet when Wright was murdered by the INLA in December 1997, evidence would emerge of a relationship between the LVF and elements of the UFF on the Shankill Road. That is very ironic because the very same people wanted him dead. There was a spate of loyalist killings after the Wright murder, during which the UFF used the LVF's name and its code word to try to hide its involvement in the attacks. There was clearly a relationship between the two groups then, and a suspicion, to put it mildly, that that relationship still exists. When the LVF staged this show of strength in Portadown just a few weeks ago, the convicted UFF leader Johnny Adair and other prominent Shankill loyalists were there to cheer them on. To many, this was the clearest possible proof of an alliance. And so bitter are the divisions within loyalism that before Saturday's march on the Shankill, the UVF sought and believed it had an assurance that no LVF regalia would be displayed. The raising of an LVF flag was the spark that ignited the violence on the Shankill. There's people using the discontent within loyalism to, uh, to, to build up a new um, power base and also to undermine the agreement. You're talking about the UFF and the Lower Shankill, I assume. I'm talking about the UFF and the Lower Shankill because the UFF as a whole is not, as I understand it, is very unhappy about this situation, as unhappy as other loyalists are. Johnny Adair and other loyalists filmed on the Shankill today. Many believe he has the power to end the feuding. But at this stage, there's nothing to suggest a mood for mediation. Brian Rowan, BBC News. From ITN, the ITV Nightly News with Mark Austin. Good evening. The former loyalist prisoner and paramilitary leader, Johnny Mad Dog Adair, is back behind bars tonight. He was arrested in Belfast on the direct orders of the Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Mandelson, after days of escalating violence between rival loyalists. Mr Mandelson said it was time for everyone to confront what he called the dark side of Northern Ireland society. Colin Baker has the latest. Tonight's police operation on the Shankill Road to arrest John Adair is a massive gamble by the Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Mandelson. The arrest involving scores of IUC officers came at the end of a day of unease in the area and a day in which the Northern Ireland Secretary met with police and army commanders. The streets of the Lower Shankill were sealed by IUC Land Rovers. Armed officers in riot gear took control of the alleyways leading in and out of the close where Adair lives with his wife and family. The response locally was one of disciplined quiet. Crowds of Adair and UFF supporters gathered to watch, but only in silence. The Northern Ireland office said later Adair's licence from prison had been suspended. Peter Mandelson saying his priority was public safety and he couldn't give freedom to an individual intent on abusing it. So far, people are very quiet, very calm. Can you keep it that way? Well, I would appeal to people to keep it calm and keep it quiet. No one wants to see what happened just right on the streets of Belfast again. But um, we just have to be very patient in the days and weeks ahead. Earlier, as calls were made by Conservatives for his arrest, Adair was on the Shankill Road wearing a bulletproof vest. He was closely watched by RUC officers 200 yards away as he talked with a church representative and a city councillor, both hoping, but without success, of finding a way of stopping the violence. I can't think of any scenario where we can get these people together. The only time they will come together in is when there's a bloodletting, when there's countless uh, lives lost, and then they'll talk. Earlier, one Loyalist faction leader was summoned to a meeting with the Northern Ireland Secretary. Loyalist paramilitaries are on the brink of doing to their community what the IRA failed to do with 30 years of conflict. Uh, and I think that they have to step back and understand the damage which is being done. Tonight, Adair is being held at McGabbery Prison in County Antrim. Colin Baker, ITN, Belfast. Good evening and now the local news. The convicted UFF commander Johnny Adair is back in jail tonight after the Secretary of State suspended his licence which allowed early release. He was arrested after talks between Peter Mandelson and security chiefs about the feud between the UFF and UVF which has seen gun attacks and two murders. The UDP leader Gary McMichael, who met the Secretary of State earlier, said that Mr Mandelson did not make him aware of his intention to recall Johnny Adair to prison. Letitia Fitzpatrick reports. Johnny Adair, seen here on the Shankill Road today wearing a bulletproof vest, is tonight behind bars in McAbury Prison. The Secretary of State suspended his licence after a full report from the security forces and on the advice of the police. 
Peter Mandelson says his priority is public safety and he cannot give freedom to an individual intent on abusing it. He says he's satisfied that Johnny Adair has breached the terms of his licence, that he won't allow anyone to prejudice the interests of the whole community and that people don't want to live under the heel of gangsters who use paramilitary methods for their own ends. He urged loyalists to put the feuds of the past behind them. Johnny Adair was freed from the Mayes prison last September after serving just five and a half years of a 16-year sentence for directing terrorism. He was a UDA commander in Belfast. Earlier this evening, the Ulster Democratic Party leader told the Secretary of State at Hillsborough that his party is pursuing a mediation process between the UFF and the UVF. Tonight on the Lower Shankill estate, a crowd gathered near Johnny Adair's home after trouble flared between local youths and the police. Belfast Deputy Lord Mayor said he was there to calm tensions. We have a whole street sealed off here. We've had, we've had an audience pass around the horse, but was suspected heart, heart attack. The police came into this area. Um, they brutally attacked the people that lived in the area. And now I'm down to try and get the, the whole problem resolved. I don't know what's going to happen. I would appeal to people to keep it calm and keep it quiet. No one wants to see what happened just around on the streets of Belfast again. But um, we just have to be very patient in the, in the days and weeks ahead. It's understood Johnny Adair was arrested around 8 this evening. He was a front seat passenger in a red Cavalier driving up the Shankle towards Woodville. Police stopped the car and Johnny Adair and the driver were ordered out and onto the ground. The Loyalist leader was then arrested, put into a police vehicle and driven off to Girdwood Barracks where he was airlifted to Macabre Jail. I'm not surprised and I think Johnny Adair won't be surprised to actually discuss that with him today given the number of people that were calling for his arrest. But I think that uh, many of the people aren't aware of, uh, of the, the, the facts because people uh, you know, in the media have uh, sensationalised a lot of issues surrounding Johnny Adair. He maintains that since his release he hasn't been involved in any illegal activities and uh, you know, that's the basis of, of returning someone to prison if they're involved in any illegal activities and he, he certainly hasn't been. What difference would it make to the feud that's been going on between the uh, UFF and the UVF? Well, it won't make any difference at all. I think the, uh, the feud is between the UFF and the UVF. It's not about Mr Adair, it's about the leadership of that organisation. Troops on the Shankill Road maintaining an uneasy peace between the feuding loyalists. The arrest of Johnny Adair, fueling fears of further killings. Gina Adair protesting her husband's innocence. He's not doing any harm. He hasn't done anything. They haven't got him on film pulling triggers. They haven't got him on film doing anything illegal or anything like that. So why? Why take him off the street? There's loads of people there that's out in license and everywhere. Why, why not let them? Why just Johnny? Because of who he is. The UDP chairman John White says his party will be legally challenging the Secretary of State's decision. He sees no end to the feud. Is this feud going to continue? Well, unfortunately, I think it will. Um, I believe that if the security forces hadn't have swamped this area, that we would have been talking about a, a, a large loss of life. I have no doubt about that, given the feelings um, that were prevalent uh, amongst paramilitaries in this area. Uh, we have tried for mediation and that has been scorned. Uh, we've been told that the uh, UFF want revenge for the murder of one of their colleagues. And uh, unfortunately, um, we, we seem to be going into a, a, a spiral of violence if, if people don't uh, get a bit of sense. Down the Shankill Road and the PUP's Billy Hutchinson believes things are now at a critical stage. It's quite tense and ordinary people who are not involved in any organisation are quite worried about the situation and uh, that's understandable. But I do think that all we can do is wait and see what the consequences are. Are there any moves towards mediation? Well, my understanding is that there's not at this minute. Uh, and I've said before that I think that uh, there will be mediation sooner or later, but it just depends on how many people die before that happens or don't die.